It's an honor to chair uh, the keynote session today. And of course, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dominic Wilkinson uh, for this keynote uh, address. So uh, Prof Wilkinson is a professor of uh, medical ethics and deputy director of the Oxford uh, Center for Practice, uh, Practical Ethics. He's also a practicing clinician. He's a consultant at the Newborn Intensive Care at the John Radcliffe uh, Hospital in Oxford and a senior research fellow at the Jesus College, Oxford. So he's published more than 200 academic uh, articles related to ethical issues for adults, children, and newborn uh, infants. He's co-authored several books, and I understand that these are all must-read for people who are in the field of bioethics. I think he was uh, awarded the prestigious uh, British Medical Association President's Award in 2018. Uh, uh, by the uh, British Medical Association Book Awards. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Wilkinson to give us uh, his uh, keynote uh, lecture. Thank you. It's great to see you all. Uh, thank you so much, Roy, uh, for inviting me. Thank you, Yung Seng, for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's a great honor to be able to, to be at the start of the APEC meeting, I, I have to say, I never imagined that I would be speaking at APEC and the audience is slightly different than, than the APEC that I, I'm used to but uh, seeing on television, but I think this is a, a much more intelligent and thoughtful audience, I suspect, than, than APEC is, is used to. Um, good. So what I wanted to do, it, thinking it, along the lines of emerging issues in pediatric bioethics, is talk about something that... Uh, that I was invited by some colleagues to think about very recently. So I'm going to start, as I almost always do, uh, with a couple of cases. Uh, Kelly's a 14-year-old girl with relapsed Ewing sarcoma. She presented at the age of 12 years with a swelling of her left knee. Uh, the mass was a Ewing sarcoma, childhood bone cancer, for which she underwent various cycles of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, uh, tumor resection, knee reconstruction. This saved her leg. She achieved disease remission after a number of months. Uh, but now at age 14, she has new areas of cancer in many areas of bone, her lungs, uh, including a lump that's at risk of compressing her spine, causing paraplegia. Uh, the likely survival of children with this type of early and aggressive relapse is less than 10%. There are chemotherapy options which may slow the growth or shrink the tumor. There's a clinical trial offering an experimental treatment not proven to help the specific tumor, but could theoretically help. We'll also advance scientific understanding. Chemotherapy and experimental treatments might have, as we might imagine, unpleasant side effects. So the decision is whether to try chemotherapy, enroll Kelly in a clinical trial, or forego these uh, and focus entirely on comfort care. Should we ask Kelly what she thinks? Mahmoud is a six-year-old boy who's presented to hospital with a fractured right radius uh, after a fall at soccer. He's otherwise well. The fracture's displaced, requires reduction and a plaster cast. His pain's been uh, relieved with paracetamol, low-dose tramadol, but he's extremely fearful of the proposed reduction. And he just wants a cast. His parents are at the bedside, and they say, just get on with it, just do it. Uh, but he's, his fear is rising, uh, and you consider the option of a brief anesthetic. Should we listen to Mahmoud? Simon's a 16-year-old boy. His nutrition's failing. He's uh, diagnosed with cystic fibrosis some years ago, uh, and, and then later with cystic fibrosis-related diabetes. He's hoped that insulin therapy would recover his nutritional state, but this has not happened. Uh, his BMI's continued to drop. Uh, previously, it had been discussed with him the possibility of a gastrostomy feeding tube to support his Nutrition, his parents have come back now and say that he needs a gastrostomy. He's adamant that he's not having a feeding tube. So the, the question raised by these cases uh, and highlighted in the, the title of this talk is about the role of children in decision-making about treatment for children. Uh, and I was inspired to, to give, give this talk by an invitation by... Uh, John Messi and colleagues at the Royal Children's Hospital, together with uh, Ros uh, McDougall and, and others, 
who they've worked with for many years, who, who are writing a new collection on this title, Deciding with Children. I'll talk a, a bit about what that means shortly. And they invited me to, to write a chapter. So I went away and, and uh, have come up with some thoughts. Uh, but it remains to be seen whether, whether they make any sense. So you, you guys can help me work out whether, whether I've got anything sensible to say. So what I thought I'd do in this talk is talk generally about ethical principles. We'll talk about this potentially new third principle. Uh, and then I'm going to pose some challenges, some questions, uh, and think about where the limits of this principle might be. Okay, so ethics in pediatrics. You guys, you're all experts. You're very familiar with this. So we're going to start with things that you're all going to know lots about. So where should we start? Well, obviously, we start with the idea of the best interests of the child. Um, this is uh, so much part of our, uh, our DNA as, as pediatricians and, and ethicists. It's hard to imagine a time when this was not uh, a foundational principle. Uh, but of course, uh, it was not so long ago that, uh, particularly in relation to decisions uh, for children um, in relation to where they should live, that it wasn't automatically thought what was best for the child. But that has become, over time, the, the driving force in, in incorporated in, uh, in statements like this within the, the United Nations Convention, uh, in all actions concerning children, whether undertaken by public or private social welfare institutions, etc., etc., the best interest of the child shall be a primary consideration. And although best interest is a slightly opaque term, we, we kind of understand this is a beneficence principle. It's about doing what is best for the child? Should the child live with the, the mother or the father? The question is, what would be best for the child? And in more difficult condition uh, situations where we're talking about life or death conditions, what we're trying to do is to weigh up the positives versus the negatives of different courses of action in many cases. The positives of continued life, these are the types of decisions that I'm often thinking about in NICU, versus the negatives of continuing that life, the unpleasantness, the pain, the suffering that the child will undergo if they continue to, uh, if we continue life prolonging measures. Now, best interests look like a very simple principle. You weigh up the positives against the negatives. Uh, if the positives outweigh the negatives, it's in the child's best interest. If the negatives outweigh the positives, it's not in the child's best interest. If you've got more than one option, you just weigh them all and work out which one's most positive. Easy? Well, one thing about the best interest principle is that it doesn't say anything about parents. So, although it seems like a good principle, that looks a long way from what we actually do. We spend a lot of time, you guys spend an, a lot of time talking to parents. So we need another principle, uh, which is that when we're making deci decisions with children, we should uh, involve the parents in the decisions. We don't think like this model that, that the parents disappear. Uh, it's just what's in the child's best interest. Why do we take parents' views into consideration? Well, there's a range of reasons. There are some epistemic reasons. That's a fancy philosopher's term for knowledge. They know their child very well, most of the time better than we do, particularly, obviously, for older children. They know what the child likes, doesn't like, might be able to cope with, um, their experience of health procedures, etc., etc. The child's interests partly derive from, particularly in terms of values, the, 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 the parent's interests, and they overlap with the parent's interests. So what's good for the child will often be good for the parents and vice versa. Um, there is, and I'm sure we'll come to this at the end of the day in, in the debate with Julian, there is significant moral uncertainty around uh, many decisions that we face. There isn't necessarily a single right answer, an obvious better than the alternatives uh, option. Uh, so, and in that context of moral uncertainty, it is, uh, we've got a strong reason to, to be involving parents in that decision. And then, uh, although the child's interests are, are right at the centre, the decisions that we make will also affect parents and other members of the family. Um, and that matters. Uh, in, pediatri in pediatrics, we often talk about treating the whole family. Um, 
we don't just ignore the impact on, on other individuals. And occasionally, we will take into account those, those effects on other individuals uh, and perhaps deviate from the best, what would be best for the child, taking into account the effect on parents and on other members of the family. So we have this idea that we should be making decisions with parents. Uh, another way of expressing that is, is through a, a principle of shared decision making. I'll come back to it, but shared decision making is a continuum, um, but it means involving parents to a variable degree. Uh, the idea of clinicians and parents together um, making a decision about, uh, about what to do in terms of treatment for the child. So here we are, we've got best interest we're very familiar with, making decisions with parents, shared decision making, again, super familiar with. Uh, you'll all have been doing that all the time, you'll been teaching all that. So, so what's this uh, third principle? Well, the new principle, and uh, again, that you know already because it was in the title of the talk, is this idea of deciding with children. Um, and this phrase, uh, I'm not 100% sure if John uh, invented it or, uh, or he's, he's found it elsewhere and, uh, and embraced it, but John Massey, uh, in an editorial a couple of years ago, uh, talked about how in paediatrics we typically engage in negotiation. I've described it already, this sort of shared decision-making with parents. That's what we spend sometimes half or three-quarters of our consultation doing. Um, and in that negotiation, often the child's view is just absent. We might, uh, if, if, we're, uh, if, if we have time, we might try and listen to the voice of the child. The, the, again, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child say we should listen to, to the child's voice. All children have a right for their voice to be heard and listened to. But often that'll be a kind of afterthought, end of the consultation. What does the child think? And then, of course, the child thinks something that isn't very convenient. Then you send the parents away to go and convince the child to do the right thing. But that, according to, to John, is not good enough. Uh, listening, saying, I hear you, is not deciding with children. Why should we decide with children? Well, the, the idea, obviously, is that children are at the centre of these decisions, that rather than as an afterthought or as a final uh, consideration or send the parents away to go and uh, persuade the child, we should be, at the start, identifying the preferences and priorities of the child. They should be a starting point for, for consideration. So, with that in mind, uh, we have this type of model. There are these three different principles that we might be thinking about uh, for decision-making for the child. Uh, the best interests of the child, deciding with parents or shared decision-making with parents, and deciding with children. So here, here the, I have this kind of pyramid of, of reasons or considerations. Sounds extremely attractive and plausible. You're probably saying, well, that's kind of what we do already. So, so, so what, what, what would there be to, what problem would there be with this? Well, one challenge to the idea of deciding with children is a problem of vagueness. Um, and this, this objection is a common one, actually in, throughout ethics, in relation to a whole lot of ethical principles, whether it's autonomy, justice, beneficence, etc. certainly shared with the problem of best interests. So, so many critics of best interests of the child will say, yeah, that's all very well, but what does that actually mean in practice? Kelly's case. Which of those options is in her best interest? The best interest principle does not tell us at all doesn't help us. You can kind of wheel out the best interest principle. It doesn't tell you. Chemotherapy, uh, trial of treatment, palliative care. Yeah, that's great, but, but, but what should we do? It's shared with uh, shared decision making. So I mentioned that shared decision making is a spectrum. From parents make a little bit of the decision and the doctor does 99% of the decision, to Parents make 99% of the decision and the doctor does 
1% of the decision. That's all shared decision making. Anywhere in between, that's shared decision making. The principle doesn't tell you. Should you be at 1% or 99%, 50%? It's because 50%, Although that looks like an attractive option, that's not what shared decision making necessarily is. Maybe, sometimes it, that's the right thing, but the principle itself doesn't tell you. And so you have the same challenge for deciding with children. If we're deciding with the child, how much input are we having? Are we saying the child makes 99% of the decision, 1% or somewhere in between? There's a, there's a kind of further challenge which is that when we think about uh, deciding with the child, asking the child what do they want, we might be thinking of two separate things. So we might be thinking of their substantive view. So their view, for example, Kelly's view, what is she, does she want chemothera more chemotherapy? Does she want to go in the trial? Has she had enough? Does she just want to be kept comfortable? We, that might be one element of what she wants. But there's a second layer, a higher level, level, it's lower down in this order, but you'll just have to forgive me for that. Um, that's a higher order preference, which is, does she want to make this decision? Or does she want her parents to make this decision? Now you might think, and it seems highly plausible, that the higher order de decision helps us work out where we should be in terms of how much she makes the decision. So if she really wants to make this decision, we should be right over it, towards the, her making a lot of this decision. We might not abandon her to make this decision all by herself, but uh, if she doesn't want to make this decision, we might be much more towards the other end. So, so that, that looks like an attractive answer, and indeed it's an attractive answer too for the shared decision-making vagueness question. How much should we share decisions with parents? Well, part of the answer, it's not the whole answer, is how much do parents want to make this decision versus want us to make this decision. But there is an additional challenge, which is that, at least in some cases, the substantive view about what the child wants and their higher order view might conflict. So, for example, the child might not want to make the decision, might want the parents to make the decision, but the decision that the parents might make might conflict with what they would actually choose if they made the decision. Or they might wish to make a decision, but the, uh, in doing so, they might make uh, a choice that conflicts with, uh, with their wishes. They, that, that's a, a kind of less, less plausible uh, conflict to occur. But there's a different type of conflict, because, which is evident as soon as we start talking about deciding with children, which is that the child's wishes are potentially going to conflict with the parents. And again, that might occur in two different ways. So the child might wish to make the decision, but the parents might wish for them to make the decision. Or the child might wish the parents to make the decision, and the parents might wish the child to make the decision. So they might go in different directions, or they might be in common. The child might wish for treatment A, whereas parents want treatment B, or vice versa. So again, it, in some cases, deciding with the child, deciding with parents' best interests are all going to converge. That's in, in a sense, if, if this is our triangular model, if we turn it into a pyramid, they're all going to come together at, at the top. That's great. That's climbing the mountain, to, to use uh, Derek Parfitt's analogy. Everyone's going, going up the mountain from different sides. That would be wonderful. But of course, quite a lot of the time, that's not going to be the case, that we're going to have people going in different directions. Well, so what do we do when parents and the child have different views? Well, one thing that you might uh, already be aware of, and th this is going to come back tomorrow in Ross's talk, is that we already have a, a, an idea about what to do when doctors disagree with parents. We have a, this idea that there's a zone of parental discretion. So there's a range of treatments uh, or a range of choices that we allow parents to make. Within that range, the parents can decide in favour of a treatment or decide against that treatment, and different parents in the exact same scenario will make different decisions. Two parents, two sets of parents with a premature baby born at 23 weeks, 
uh, again, to kind of make a connection to our debate later in the day, one of them might choose active intensive care, the other might choose palliative care, exact same clinical scenario, make different decisions, falls within the zone of parental discretion. So we might uh, draw on the zone of parental discretion uh, and say, well, perhaps that's going to help us in situations where the views of the child conflict with the views of parents. Because if the views of the child are within that zone and the, the parents are outside, we can ignore the parents and we just go with the child. But that doesn't help us if they're both inside the zone of parental discretion, but they've got different views. In Kelly's case, plausibly, these three options are all within the zone of parental discretion. If Kelly wants palliative care, parents want chemotherapy. Or what if the parent's choice is within the zone of parental discretion, but the child's is outside? Do we allow the child uh, to make this decision or not? So again, we, we, have, uh, we have this challenge, and it's not clear on the, using the principle of, of deciding with children how we should resolve that. I've alluded to it already, but there's a different type of conflict. So uh, uh, on the other limb of our, our triangle here, the child's wishes might conflict with what would be best for them. And we're very familiar with that as parents, that the things that our children want sometimes are not what would be best for them, whether that's eating lots of sweets at bedtime, uh, deciding not to brush their teeth, throwing their homework in the rubbish, whatever, whatever that we're familiar. Strange as it may seem, children don't always make wise choices that would be best for them. So what do we do with that? What do we do when the child's wishes, views, preferences, deviate from what would be best for them? Well, we might think one attractive idea again uh, is that there's something a bit like the zone of parental discretion, but for children. So there might be a range of choices that we allow the child to make, uh, but it has limits. So it might look like this. So, so here's our, our range of choices in the middle. Um, on, on my slides, uh, it's, it's green, orange, and red, but on, on the screen here, it's green, blue, and blue. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm suddenly feeling uh, I, I have an insight into color blindness. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. So if you're, if you're in, if the child's making a decision that's in the zone of parental, a zone of child discretion, we can go along with it. If they're making a decision that would be harmful for the child to refuse the treatment, we shouldn't allow them to refuse it, etc. If they're requesting a treatment that would be harmful, we shouldn't go along with it. And of course. Again, very familiar to us in paediatrics, this idea of a zone of child discretion is going to be a bit different from the, the zone that we have for parents in that it's going to change depending on the, the, the maturity of the child. We're presumably going to want to give the child more discretion as they get older compared to when they're four or five or six or two or three. The, the younger child, we might give very little discretion. The older child, we might give quite a lot, though not complete discretion. So we might be left with a model that looks like this. This is what I, I, I call, I've invented, the autonomy-dependent zone of child discretion. So the idea is that you have this sort of crescendoing or increasing space for the child to make decisions for themselves. That, that seems plausible. We'll, we'll, we'll come to the kind of cliff edge at the end of that in, in a couple of slides' time. Um, okay, so, so I've talked about some of the challenges of deciding with children, but what I want to move on now is to, to the kind of the hard limits. When shouldn't we decide with children? Well, I, I alluded already to this idea of a, of a spectrum of shared decision-making or a spectrum of deciding with children. I said that anywhere from the child making 1% of the decision to 99% of the decision might count. But the child making 0% of the decision or 100% of the decision is not deciding with children. At one end of this is what I call deciding by the child. That's where the child is making the decision. And other people, they can express their views, but it's the child who makes the decision. 
And here's, a, here's a, 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 a relevant clinical example. It might seem like a, a kind of trivial example. Child's going to have an anesthetic. Uh, the anesthetist has got a, a nasty, smelly gas. They've got some different flavored uh, little paste that they can rub on the inside of the mask. And they say to the child, which flavor do you want? Do you want strawberry? Do you want, I'm not sure what other flavors they've got. Uh, uh, bubble gum, ooh. Um, they, so they, now this is a, a decision not made with the child. It's not like we kind of help them to decide which of these is, is a better option. It's a, a decision made by the child. Um, in the same way that, yes, we have embark on shared decision making with adults, because shared decision making is not just for children. We embark on shared decision making. But it's not like we would be helping them to make a choice between flavors, uh, helping them to make a choice between options at lunch. That's their, their choice to make. Unless they want help, you, they could say, uh, I, I don't know how to choose. You could say, well, normally you like strawberry. But if they don't want to, then that's the, their decision to make. So d for decisions that are primarily based on the child's experience, uh, and, uh, so that might be taste, but also experience of pain, uh, or based on their past experience, they're strongly preference sensitive. And it's not clear that we ought to try and smudge these into the umbrella of deciding with children. The idea here is that the child should decide. We're not unless they wish for help. So the, my notion of deciding by the child is that these are decisions that are within the child's capacity to make, the child has a right to make, and doesn't wish for assistance. And, and I think it particularly applies to questions that relate to the child's subjective experience of pain, as I've alluded to already. So Mahmoud's case, where there is a question of uh, should he have a, an anesthetic and reduction, um, or just get on with it, squish his arm, put the plaster on. Um, that seems like a decision that we shouldn't be making with him, but ultimately he should be making. So this is uh, within the autonomy dependent zone of child discretion. One, one thought about the, the zone of uh, discretion uh, that I, I don't think has been um, uh, identified previously is that there's a, there might be different areas within that space. There might be an inner zone uh, and an outer zone. And when we're uh, thinking about decisions that are more risky uh, or more uncertain, we may, we may be deviating from this uh, uh, idea that the child ultimately should make the decision. So if the anesthetic were significantly risky, and actually is a much more complicated decision about whether to weigh up a, a general anesthetic versus, for example, some form of light sedation. Um, that is starting to look, particularly for a six-year-old, though maybe not for a 15-year-old, like a decision that we should be making with them rather than just by them saying, I want to have a general anesthetic. So that, that's at one end of the spectrum. That's one limit to deciding with children. The other end of the spectrum is where we decide for the child. And uh, uh, the, the kind of most obvious and, and kind of uh, paradigmatic cases where a, a young person is refusing a, a clearly life-saving intervention, refusing a blood transfusion uh, on the basis of religious or other, or other values, um, that decision in most jurisdictions is regarded as being outside the zone of discretion for children. We don't allow those children to make it, no matter how uh, mature they are, until they cross uh, the kind of magical threshold to, to adulthood. I'll, I'll, again, I'll come back to that in very shortly. So we decide for the child in situations where either the child lacks capacity or it's outside. It's, these are harmful decisions that the child is proposing to make. In such cases, we might still ask the, the young person what they want, but we're not going to give it any weight. If it's 
if it's outside the zone of child discretion, we can't give it any weight. The fact that the young person doesn't want transfusion, we can listen to it, but we're not going to follow it. And that's why I think it's not an example of deciding with the child to talk to the young person and say, your hemoglobin is terribly low. I know your religion says uh, that you shouldn't have a blood transfusion, um, but we're going to give you a blood transfusion. That's not deciding with the child. That's deciding for the child. But the, the Jehovah's Witness case raises another challenge. And, th and this, is a, this is not particularly related to the deciding with children, but I, I thought I'd, I'd talk about this because I think it's one of the enduring and interesting, if though not really emerging, it's, it's a long-standing challenge for us in paediatrics. And that's about these, these kind of tricky decisions at the north end of, of childhood when, when young people are making decisions. And, uh, and he, as a way of kind of capturing... Uh, one of the paradox, if we think about blood transfusion, we can have a 16-year-old who, uh, who we would allow to consent for a blood transfusion, but we wouldn't allow to refuse a blood transfusion. Now, that looks a bit weird. Uh, on, one thing, on one way of thinking about it, and the way we would normally think about it for adults is, if somebody can make a decision, they ought to be able to make a decision both ways. If we only allow them to make a decision one way, we're not really allowing them to make a decision. So it doesn't really count as consent, maybe. The other, the other kind of interesting, uh, and it's doubly paradoxical, <laughs> because normally we think negative autonomy is stronger than positive autonomy. So normally, we, we think it's more important to respect people's refusal than their consent. But in adolescence, it's the opposite. We allow their consent, their positive consent, but we don't allow their refusal. And then, as I alluded, there's this cliff edge. So if we have this zone of child discretion, we still have these boundaries. But then suddenly they cross this magical threshold, and suddenly they're allowed to make any foolish decision they want to, to refuse treatment, albeit they can't demand treatment. So, so why do we have this weird kind of consent refusal asymmetry? Well, very briefly, because I'm running out of time. Um, one, the, he, here, are, here are three reasons uh, why we might treat decisions to consent to, to procedures different from decisions to refuse. One is that, that what's required to have capacity to make decisions to consent to a treatment might not be as complicated as refusing a recommended treatment. And that's um, because potentially, and, and this, uh, this gets to the second point, uh, these, are, these are treatments that are recommended by a health professional in the context of the, the, what would be best for the individual. And if the, if the patient refuses it, and, and these, these uh, cases of overriding refusal are typically life prolonging interventions, what we're talking about is the young person's death. Thinking about mortality, weighing up big kind of life and death decisions, that's a big decision. That's, that, that's very substantial. Thinking about whether to, uh, thinking about having a transfusion or having a recommended treatment seems like a much smaller decision. So if we think the capacity is decision specific, it may well be that capacity to consent to a decision is different from the capacity to refuse treatment. But I want to just allude to, the, like, finally, to this idea that a right to refuse life-sustaining treatment is a de facto right to die. If we allow young people to refuse insulin, ventilation for a chest infection, blood transfusion when they're anemic, we allow them to choose to die. Now, obviously, most, for, mo for most, they, they won't have that option because they're not going to be dependent on life-sustaining treatment, but that's, that's what it amounts to. Now, in some cases, that's going to align with what would be in their best interest. We may well indeed, perhaps in Callie's case, we would respect that choice. But in other cases, it's going to deviate from their interests. At present, we simply allow that right at, uh, as the individual gets to adulthood. But if we think of it in this way, that, that we might... Uh, I mean, we might wish to move away from that kind of artificial uh, 
adulthood-based status quo, that's the, the kind of second option here, towards something that's linked to capacity, because that seems to be the key criterion, but perhaps is more stringent. So rather than saying when the, the adolescent gains capacity, maybe at 16 we allow them to choose to die from, from severe anemia, we might say actually quite a lot of 18-year-olds don't have sufficient capacity to make that decision. Maybe we're going to, to uh, override the 18-year-old or the 19-year-old or the 20-year-old. Maybe if we think we have to have some uh, common rule, we would set, it, set the age at a higher age, at 21 or 25. And uh, I think other talks in this conference might be talking about some of the challenges of, uh, of decision-making for young adults and uh, all the evidence that we're aware of about some of the, the, the autonomy challenges at that age. So just very briefly in the last uh, minute or two, um, if we return to deciding with children, thinking about Kelly, the idea that I, I've introduced is that we no longer think purely about the best interest of the child, but we need to think about these three principles. And I'm going to suggest that we should think about them in this clockwise way. So we might start off by thinking about what options are plausibly in the best interests of Kelly. And, and I've alluded already and said, well, these three options might be in her best interest. We might then move round to, to the child's wishes and think about, is there a choice here that lies within the autonomy dependent zone of child discretion? If there is, does she have sufficient capacity to make that choice? Does she want to decide? So if there's a choice and she has capacity and she wants to decide, then we're going to stop there and say, okay, tell us, tell us what your, your wishes are. We are then going to need to go further and say, what are the parents' wishes in the light of what the young person's just said about what their wishes are? And we might find, actually, at that point, we've, we've gone as far as we need to because the parents, having listened to Callie, who says, I don't want to go through any more, say, we don't want to put her through anymore. And we, we don't have a challenge. Uh, we don't have a problem. But if she doesn't want to make the decision, she doesn't have the capacity to make that decision, then we're going to have passed through the deciding with child. We're now going to be making a decision for her, but in conjunction with the parents. So to sum up, we've, I've, I've introduced this third ethical principle in paediatrics. Hopefully uh, you agree that this is uh, useful. It's probably very familiar already. Might not change radically what we already do, but might reframe some of the questions and the way that we think about them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, for the wonderful lecture. So I'd like to, there's a time for question and answer. So it's open to the floor. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Maybe you can state your name and where you're from. Okay. Thanks, uh, Owen Schaefer from the Center for, Bi Center for Biomedical Ethics. So thanks very much for that, that uh, wonderful primer on uh, some of the nuances of pediatric ethics. I wanted to ask, though, about this triangulation that you have there and, and how, how really distinct those three concepts are, right? Uh, best interests, um, uh, deciding with parents, deciding with children. So for example, with deciding with parents, it looked like three of the four justifications for why you might decide with parents were actually derivative of the child's best interests, right? So some of it is about epistemic, okay, how do we figure out what the child's best interests are? We ask, ask the parents. Some of the child's interests are derivative of the child parental interests, they're wrapped up together, okay? And then also this moral uncertainty, that's about moral uncertainty, I think, over maybe what is in the child's best interest. Only when we get to the fourth point about parental rights is really distinct. Uh, and then some, well, relatedly with ch uh, deciding with children, arguably one, one aspect of a child's best interest is partly deter determined by or constituted by the child's values, priorities, and preferences, especially as the child becomes more mature. And so the, the result of this kind of suggestion, there's a lot more overlap maybe than was indicated. Um, instead of the clockwise approach, which I guess you say a sequential approach, it might be more integrated, uh, which is to say, if it is the case that best interest actually is found in all three of these corners, um, it might, might be that actually the best interest paradigm is actually the one we should be looking towards. And to the extent that we're going to parents, the extent that we're going to children, it is ultimately predicated on what is going to inform the child's best interests. So, whereas it, I, I work with a clockwise approach, if you kind of wait to go to the next stage, you're actually missing out. You can't fully determine 
what is the child's best interest maybe before you talk to the child, before you talk to the parents. You need that information from the parents and the children, depending on their age, um, before you really know, before the care team really knows uh, what is in the child's best interests. So, so I mean, the, the idea of a sequential approach isn't that you, you have to go in this order. You could go in, in different ways. Um, I think that the attraction of thinking about these separately is that they, these principles can clearly uh, diverge. So they will often uh, converge, and of course that's what we're aiming for. As I pointed to, that's the idea of, of the kind of moving towards a common point. Um, I mean, one of the points that you made is a point that's often made, which is we don't need these other ethical principles. We just go by best interest. And, and often people have this very expansive notion of best interest and say, look, best interest just is um, paying attention to the voice of the child, just is paying attention to the voice of parents. But then, then we have this kind of internal challenge, which is but sometimes when you listen to the voice of the child, that's going to pull you away from what you think is in the best interest of the child. And, and if we think just in terms of best interest, we can't capture that intuition. Or likewise, the, the challenge that sometimes, and, it, and it's uh, ov obviously a very re recurring challenge in pediatrics, the wishes of parents will pull away from the best interest of the child. So I think we do need to think about these three different vectors of reason, these three different ways albeit, as you say, they, they're going to interrelate and overlap uh, to large degrees, and hopefully, in many cases, will converge. More questions? Hi, thanks. I'm D.I. from Malaysia. Um, thanks for the talk. I was just curious about the triangulation. So if you go with deciding with the child and then moving on to deciding with the parents, and what if they disagreed? And wouldn't it be like, well, of course the parents have thought about what's best for the child anyway. Even after listening to what the child says, they still disagree. Then wouldn't that be disrespectful to the child because you've asked them and then we don't, we don't listen to them? So, so I think there's an interesting question about whether it's more disrespectful to ask the child what they want and then say, no, we're not going to do that, or to not ask the child. Um, I think we don't ask the child, then we won't have any chance to respect the child's wishes. Of course, there is this further question. And as I say, it's a kind of open question about what to do when deciding with the child conflicts with deciding with parents. And if they're both reasonable choices, potentially consistent with the best interest of the child, there isn't a single or, or obvious answer. I mean, obviously, what we would try to do is to support the two of them to come together, uh, particularly for the older child. We would often want to give significant, much more weight to the wishes of the child. Maybe for the younger child, we, we're going to accept more weight to the, the wishes of the parents. But there isn't a, a de defined answer. That is, as in many cases in, in, in ethics, a point at which ethical principles diverge and it, it creates an ethical dilemma. But, but th that's the nature of the beast. All right. Uh -huh. Okay, um, hi, uh, I'm Morelli. Uh, I'm from the Center for Biomedical Ethics. Uh, so thanks for the talk, and I think this is, I think, following on from um, Owen's point. So I think uh, one reason to think that um, child's, children's best interest actually matters is because it's a question of, you know, what ultimately matters, right? And if we say that, well, uh, we are looking, for example, why, why care about capacity at all, right? Why care about what the child wants? Well, um, because, well, two reasons, right? We, we care about the wishes of capacitors people because um, their decisions actually do change our moral duties towards them, right? Um, they exercise their moral powers and um, this can change our duties or permissions towards them. This is different for those who lack capacity, right? For those who lack capacity, um, their decisions don't really have this uh, ability to change our duties towards them. Rather, what happens is that um, their, their preferences are purely epistemic in the way they, um, and in the way they um, affect our, what our duties to, are towards them, right? For example, at least subjectively speaking, right? So in that case, then, um, what ultimately matters um, in the decision is best interest, and everything else is just purely instrumental towards them, in which case we want to challenge the extent to which uh, parents do have this kind of a right or right to decision right to decision making over their child because um, 
they're only safeguarding their children's interests. They're not, um, they're not in fact, they don't in fact have the ability to um, make decisions that are um, harmful to their child. Likewise, uh, with children, right? Uh, who are these very young children who lack capacity? Uh, we want to say that well, they don't really have the, um, they they don't really have the right to decide the course of their own lives. Often we want to say this is because well, um, their preferences are extremely malleable, um, and their life doesn't really go badly if they're if this particular very silly preference of them uh, of their own. Um, doesn't get satisfied at the moment. Um, thanks, Murli. Uh, so th I think there's a lot in there, and I'm not sure I, I have a, a kind of single so, short answer. All right, so in short, everything still boils down to p best in children's best interests, right? So, so, so I, what, one of the, the interesting tensions, and there are two different views of, are about the relationship between best interests and autonomy um, for adults. So, so uh, one of the claims that some people make is that an individual's wishes just determines what would be in their best interest. It kind of swamps any other consideration. So uh, what would be in the best interest of an adult is irrelevant. Uh, you have to do what the capacitous individual wants. I think it's more parsimonious uh, to say there are two separate, and you alluded to this, there are two separate vectors of reason, which is the autonomy-based reasons to, to follow their wishes, and the, the well-being based reasons to do what's best for them. And for the individual who's crossed the threshold of capacity, we give primacy to, to autonomy and we allow them to make decisions that would be worse for themselves on objective grounds. It's not that the individual who is refusing a transfusion and therefore by giving up many years of happy life is making the decision that's best for them. They're making a decision that's worse for them, but that they have a right to make. Now, the challenge, and this is the challenge that I was alluding to is when do we cross the, the, this kind of Rubicon for adolescents to where we allow them to make decisions that are worse for themselves. We think they have a right to make those decisions. That, as I alluded, we could do that in different ways. We could try and, and have some kind of strictly link it to some point at which they, cr they reach the capacity threshold. We could stick to our current age threshold. We could have a new age threshold. I think that that's a kind of open question. Um, hi, my name is Sarwar Salim and I'm from Pakistan. Uh, so I'm just trying to um, kind of um, understand where, with respect to zone of parental discretion, does this uh, zone of child discretion lies? Because, I mean, we think about zone of parental discretion, especially in cases where there's a lot of uncertainty, and so we allow parents to make whatever decisions they like. And as far as I understand, for children, we, the decisions made by them are the, mostly the ones in which uh, there's uh, little harm you know, anticipated, uh, you know, like choosing which flavor of anesthesia they would want. So I'm just trying to wonder, and if do you think um, at any point in time, any threshold by harm principle uh, provides so, so, so thank you for clarifying that. So you're absolutely right. So the, 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 the kind of facile flavor of, uh, of anesthetic uh, is, a, is about deciding by the child. But when the child, we're deciding with the child, the zone of child discretion, I think is bounded by the same kind of hard lines as for, for adults, which is that we wouldn't allow a child, a young person, to make decisions that were harmful for themselves, that were posed a significant risk of serious harm. There are some kind of uh, exceptions to that, um, uh, because in some cases, imposing a treatment on a child will cause more harm than refraining from providing a treatment that normally uh, will avert harm to the, the young person. So it might be the least harmful alternative. But you're right. Uh, and so at that kind of right end of the, of the spectrum, um, the kind of biggest scope of, of child discretion is going to be very, look very similar to the zone of parental discretion. At, at a, uh, a more at a younger age, it's going to be much narrower. So the, the amount of deviation from best interests that we allow a young person to choose to make is going to be much smaller, uh, though their parents are going to have wider discretion than that. Mio? Karen? Um, so I'm Weebin, a developmental Pete, and I want to bring the thoughts to a slightly different area. 
It's a dilemma that I face every day. Um, so we talk about mental capacity and we talk about best interests. Um, I give an example of a child with severe ADHD, right, where the class teacher is frantic every day because of the child and is calling the parents every day because of the child. Work is not done and he is at risk of harm to himself and to his classmates. So the boy comes and sees you and says, I do not want to be treated, there's nothing wrong with me. The parents are at their wit's end because he's not learning, he's not doing anything, right? And, and in that scenario, um, the age of the child, knowing that, say in this case with attention deficit, they are about three years behind their peers. So um, it's really tough because to treat them, it involves them coming for behavioral management learning, right? And it also may involve medication, which they are not going to open their mouth to put the medication in. And so the parents resort to crushing the medicine, hiding it in their juice or whatever it might be. And then you are in the middle of the whole thing because you know they're hiding it in their juice. And the child says, I do not want to be treated. So then where do we stand you know, at, at this point in time? So, so thank you. So, uh, so that's a good example of the type of case that I alluded to before, which is um, uh, a decision in this case where both the child lacks the capacity and there seems to be significant har harm to the child of refusing the treatment, but also where you can't hold the child down and give the treatment. You can't drag them through the door and... and administer behavioural therapy to the, to the young person exactly, who's yeah. holding on well, to the door. Well, some parents do, actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you see them being dragged into the clinic. So, so, uh, so what you have to try to do uh, is to try and find some compromise that respects the, the young person's aversion to this therapy, but also tries to secure the best within what you're able to do. So, you, so there's some things you can't do, you, other things that you can. And, the, and those, uh, that clearly it, it encapsulates the, the ethical tensions that, that we find where, where we have these principles that are going in different, re different reasons. In this case, the parents and the, the, what the parents want and what would be in the child's best interests align, but what the young person wants is clearly pushing in a different direction. Thank you. It's great to see the enthusiasm on the floor, but I think the program needs to move on. Uh, please carry this into the tea break later, right? So please join me to thank uh, Professor Dominic Wilkinson. Thank you.